WWE's Money in the Bank pay-per-view was last night, and this felt like a really mismatched pay-per-view to me. Like, on some on some level, I get it. Like, even though Money in the Bank is, in terms of a spot fest, it's one of the bigger pay-per-views of the year, it's not one of the big four, and we know what WWE says. If it's not a big four, we'll give you a good match here and there, but we're not gonna we're not gonna break bank to turn a phrase to uh, to give you what you want in that case. The result was a very uneven pay per view for me. I watched that last night during the I think it was going on at the same time as Game of Thrones and NBA playoffs. By the way, great booking WWE. Unless you got like a narrow ravine of audience that doesn't have either of those teams in the playoffs for me. Or a diehard Game of Thrones fan, you pretty much are left with whatever scraps are there. Yes, that's a little bit derogatory about myself, I realize now. But, oh well, I said it. Let's move on. I'm not going to go through the whole card here, but I am going to touch on some basic points. First and foremost... Excuse the good in the graphic behind me. It still has Alexa Bliss front and center. Alexa Bliss did not compete due to a concussion. Her last minute substitute was Nikki Cross. I honestly don't see the hype about Nikki Cross. I, I don't get it. I, I don't. I, I know they do like the unstable gimmick and the split personality, but I feel like if she had that look and that gimmick, but was, you know, a bigger competitor, a more built competitor that i would be able to buy into it and i'd be able to say like yeah no she looks like she'd tear your head off as is she's what five foot three she's barely i mean alexa bliss in heels was taller than her when they did the last monday night raw before the pay-per-view when they did the announcement of who her replacement was going to be alexa bliss mrs uh little miss bliss five feet of fury or whatever she calls herself she was looking slightly down at nikki cross and I just don't, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I need to just give a little more time. I, I'm not super familiar with her NXT work, but I haven't seen anything yet that's explained the hype that she gets. So with that said, we kicked off the pay-per-view. No, I'm not going to do pre-card because it didn't matter. It was inconsequential. I'm going to jump right into this. The pay-per-view opened with the women's ladder in the bank match. Uh, there were some cool spots here. It was a little bit clunky at times. And, you know, poor Bailey, uh, she takes the brunt of that at one point. You definitely see a moment where the ladder gets tipped over and the head of the ladder crashes down. It looks like right on the top of her hip, like right on the top of her hip bone, uh, splits the skin. She's bleeding a little bit, but you, you just hear her howl when it hits her. And you know, that was not a planned spot. Like that hit her for real. And she's legit uh, bothered by it. You see her checking her hip, keeping a hand clasped to it for a while. She's still going through all the motions, still taking all the bumps that she's being asked to take and all that. So, hey, credit to her. Uh, she fought through like a champ. Uh, they did another strange development early on in the match. They had Carmella do a really convincing sell of a ankle or knee injury. I believe it was a knee injury. You had a moment where Mandy Rose kicked at her leg. Carmella immediately takes all weight off the leg, hobbles over to the ropes, Mandy Rose comes over and tries to engage Carmelo. Car Carmelo angrily shoves her away. Mandy sh kind of like shrugs, tries to grab her again. I mean, they did this like two or three times. And the entire body language and facial expression from Carmela is like, get the fuck off me. I'm hurt. Trainers run down to the side of the ring. She limps out, carries out. I, I legit thought she was injured. So I, I guess in that case, good for them. Like they, they pulled it off. But moment, you know, towards the end of the match, Carmella makes this hobbled, triumphant return. Had she won the match shortly after returning, I would have said, "Wow, that's a really lame tactic because you pr you protected her from taking almost any of the bumps. She took a couple, but almost any of the bumps, and let her run in and just reap the benefits at the end. And that's we know how tiresome that is in matches like this. So, um, uh, one thing that drove me crazy in this match, uh. Sonia Deville on the outside, she got involved late. But what the hell are you doing? It's a no DQ match. Like, get involved. If you're not going to hit someone with a chair or something, at the very least, climb the ladder and stop other people from threatening your buddy, uh, Mandy Rose, and her opportunity at a contract. You know what I mean? Like, 
the fact that she never got involved in that capacity and the only time she finally did get involved late, it was just like half-hearted almost. I don't know. That that kind of annoyed me where I'm like, I know that it's wrestling. I know that it's predetermined. But in a real-world logic scenario, you're looking at this and you're saying, can't get disqualified, huh? Well, chair shot to you, uh, shove you off the ladder. You know what I mean? Like there's all kinds of interference. But – some great spots in this match. Uh, a lot of people flipped and slammed onto ladders. Uh, Bailey again took some sick bumps in this match. Ember Moon with probably the best high spot of the match. She is up high on a ladder outside the ring. Does the eclipse into the ring, the flipping stunner off normally the top rope, but she jumps off the ladder over the top rope. And I'm trying to think. I think she hit Natalia with the with the eclipse in this case. I can't remember who it was but great moment uh there was another moment this was the crazy this was the crazy spot of the match that i thought was the biggest risk uh and it i don't know if they were trying to pay homage to the jeff hardy edge spear moment it never goes quite to that extreme but jesus christ uh dana brooke climbs up to the ladder it's her and mandy rose and dana grabs on to the rope above the latch and then she just lets, like, she lifts herself off. You know, she's got a physique, as she always shows off. So she she just pulls herself up, and all of a sudden she's kicking wildly, and she's swaying on the ladder over Mandy Rose's head. And you can even tell Mandy Rose is like, oh, my Jesus. Like, we are 20 feet in the air, and you are out of control. It gets to the point where Mandy, even though, and again, in a real-world scenario, Mandy would be like, Pfft knock her off man he literally has to kind of break kayfabe and like grab her feet and guide her back to the top of the ladder because dana brooks just flailing like a mad woman out there so yeah in, in sanity no no big spot comes from the end of that they just get her back on the ladder uh at some point i guess mandy knocks her off the ladder but that was a scary moment in the match it, it's it's one of those things where like the the stills from it the photos are going to be kind of breathtaking because she's literally kicking so much so she's swaying in front of and then behind Mandy Rose, who's on the other side of the ladder and was facing her moments ago. And Mandy's just like, oh my God, like, what are we going to do here? So in the end, uh, Sonya Deville does finally get involved. She prevents Carmella from going up after Carmella. This is what I'm talking about with Sonya Deville. So when Carmella comes back, she immediately goes after uh, Mandy Rose because Mandy is who injured her. And she's smashing her head repeatedly into the step of a ladder, of a ladder on the outside. And Sonya Deville is just kind of chilling on the other side of the ring, just like, oh, oh, come on, up, oh, Mandy, 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 come on. <sighs> All right, I'll get involved. So then she goes over, stops Carmella. Then she basically is like looking up. She sets up the ladder in the middle of the ring. She's looking out at Mandy. Mandy's not really moving. She's like, "All right." She like throws her into the ring, hoists her on her back, and starts climbing the ladder with Mandy like practically unconscious on her back. Then she's like shifts her and is like basically like pushing her up to the briefcase. Mandy is still like, you know, I was about to say starstruck, but that's not the right word. Uh, basically cross-eyed out of it. And then just out of nowhere, Bailey just comes up onto the ladder. You get a brief stare down. Because I, I don't know if the timing of this was thrown off. Because you have an awkward moment there where Mandy reaches the top. And she goes like, huh. Grabs the edge of the briefcase. And she like for like three or four seconds is just like, ah. Ooh, shiny. This is going to be. And then Bailey runs up the edge. And suddenly Mandy's like. This is going to be big for my car. Oh, crap. And then there's not even like a high spot there, not like a brawl. Just And like, where was Sonya? And then I know she's kind of holding up Mandy in this case, but all they do is just Bailey pushes them both off the ladder. They come crashing to the ground and Bailey retrieves the briefcase. Bailey is your women's money in the bank ladder match winner. I have no problem with the the results. I think Bailey is a perfect choice here. I would have been okay with Mandy Rose because I do feel like they've been building and building and building her for a little while, but they won't quite pull the trigger. Uh, had her and Asuka, I'll get to that in a minute, but had her and Asuka not been kind of screwed out of their WrestleMania match, I think they might have chosen that moment to kind of anoint Mandy Rose, but that's not how it worked out. Uh, another option I would have been okay with... Uh, 
Ember Moon. I would have been really happy with Ember Moon as well. I think she's got a lot of potential. Really, anyone else in the field, I was not going to be excited about. Not Carmella. She already won one, and I think she was a waste of a champion. Uh, Naomi never moves the needle much for me, although she had some cool spots here. She's great athleticism. I just don't think she has... She has a great entrance, all elaborate. I just don't think she has the charisma, for whatever reason, to really draw people in and get over. Natalia, she's the grizzled ring vet uh, at this point of the division. She's been around forever. She she can get a good match out of people, but she's not the champion you want to build around right now. Nikki Cross, like I said, I don't really I don't really get it with her. I don't see it. Dana Brooke, I think she's still largely just eh. She's gotten better in some ways, but in other ways, she's still god awful. You know, good for her for sticking around, trying and developing, and she'll. She'll keep improving, but I don't think she's ever going to be champion material in this case unless we're talking the women's tag team championships. But I digress. Uh, good result there. Good, good setup. So before I dive into this next graphic here, actually, let me make a note real quick. Uh, if, I'm gonna, if I were to assign a grade to this match, uh, I would give it... Let's say five stars because we're talking wrestling. So five stars are great. I would give it two and a half, maybe three stars. I, I'll, I'll hold myself to something. Three stars. I, I feel like that it's okay. It wasn't a great match. There were some great spots, uh, some clunky moments. Mainly, I, I'm just uh, I'm impressed with Bailey and her kind of fighting through uh, the one real injury that we kind of saw in that match. Unfortunately, turning from there, we go into one of many, many shit fests in this in this night. The the weird under storyline of this night could not be overlooked. Although there is an explanation on this one, I'm talking, of course, about the United States Championship match, Samoa Joe and Rey Mysterio. Now, here's here's my immediate issue with this match. At WrestleMania, Joe murdered. Ray, like less than a minute, Coquina Clutch choked him out. Wow, okay, we know Ray only needs the United States Championship to complete the Grand Slam, become one of those rare glam, glam, Grand Slam winners in WWE history, but eh. he had he got this title match by beating Joe, and again, like another minute long match in which he just got a quick sudden roll up, and Joe just always like. Hey, hey, hey. I, I was pinned? That was three? No. No, Joe, no. No, that, no, that, no, no. And then he just kind of glares. Joe is Joe is so disappointingly wasted in WWE, it's unfortunate. Because I, I don't know what else to say. Unless he were to go to like an AEW at this point, I don't think he's going to get any real respect. Even though they put a title on him. They're trying to keep him somewhat menacing and credible, but they don't book him to be that way or stay that way. So it is what it is. This match, however, the theme that I was going to talk about, throughout the night, we had like four or five different referee kind of botches, and they royally screw up some of these matches later on. This one was a uh, direct effort, however. Rey Mysterio catches Joe early in the match with a kick to the face, just explodes Joe's nose, just like Becky Lynch. I don't know if he broke the orbital bone, Joe's nose looks like it just exploded. There's blood running all out of his nose. He's got a you know, line of blood right under his eye, which makes me think it might be that orbital bone. Again, it looks a lot like the Becky injury. And it's very clear early on that, ooh, that's a, that's a real injury. And because of the risk involved, they basically decide, all right, uh, we're, we're, making a, we're making a move. I don't know if Ray was the plan winner the whole time, but they're like, all right, uh, audible. Ray reverses a powerbomb into a Hurricane Rana pin. And even though Joe doesn't have his... Like, Joe's shoulder is like a solid four feet off the ground, it looks. Not literally. But, I mean, he is completely rolled on his right shoulder. Left shoulder could not be more up in the air. His arms are extended. He's not pinned. The referee still counts the three. Uh, Joe looks on in bewilderment for a moment. Ray gets the Grand Slam thing. Dominique comes out. That was a wasted storyline. Uh, Joe goes back to the back initially and it's kind of like, okay, what do I do? They're like, uh, I don't know. D we're not going to let you take a bump, but just go out there and throw Ray around. Make yourself look angry and strong for a moment. So he comes out, does a couple slams on Ray, does a senton splash uh, on Ray. D 
Dominique's looking on helplessly like, no, no, Papa, no, no. And Joe's kind of trying to entice Dominique to get in the ring, which whatever. Um, and that's it, man. Dude, I understand there's circumstances beyond their control in this case. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to give it a zero. I'm going to give it a half star because I get it. It was out of their control. I, I still think it was going to be a squash match probably, but it just completely got screwed up by what happened and WWE because of safety reasons they were always going to make that audible that they had to make. So that's that half star moving on. Uh, let's move on to another gimmick match of a different variety. Now we have Shane McMahon and the Miz in a cage match. So here's my problem with this match. I don't give a shit, a shit about the Shane McMahon best in the world gimmick. They want it to be heel heat. I just don't care. I don't. Like, it was a farce of a tournament in the first place. And the fact that they had Shane turn on Miz instead of the other way around when they lost the tag titles, okay, fine, good, whatever. I I don't really care about this feud. You know, they had the match at WrestleMania. The match was largely who gives a shit. Uh, you had the awesome suplex at the end, the superplex off the scaffold. And... I thought that was fine in that match uh, because of just the way they bounce. Shane lands on top despite being the one superplexed. And he gets the three-count victory over Miz. Keeps talking smack. Uh, you find out afterwards in real life when Shane need Shane's... Or sorry, uh, when Shane need the Miz's father in the ribs in that WrestleMania match. The reason, uh, part of the reason why, as Shane calls him, baked potato face daddy uh, fell down the way he did and then did nothing. Just kind of got work punch pummeled by Shane's worst worked punches in the world uh is because he legit cracked a rib and he just kind of shut down when you're not when you're not an athlete trained to work through that kind of thing you're just you're just gonna shut down it's too much to deal with uh you can't breathe it's a sudden sharp pain in your side and you can't do anything about it so uh this feud goes on Miz is incensed but he can't get the best of Shane he's too blinded by his rage and his need for vengeance and and that was the story of the match Miz you know, he called the stipulation for cage match. Shane, from the opening bell, is just trying to sprint out of the cage, run out of there. Miz has several opportunities to put him away. Then here comes another one of those weird referee things of the night, which is why I think this is worked into the storyline, because there's no way. That or the uh, the superstars maybe botched it, and uh, the referee had to bail his ass out. But because of the rest of the stuff going on in the night, I feel like this was just a weird theme they wanted to kind of uh, impart or convey. The Miz hits a school-crushing finale on a chair on Shane. This is after wearing Shane out with a steel chair for, like, six or seven or eight hits. Again, nothing over the head because it's modern WWE, all over the back. But uh, just brutal shots. And he's been beating the snot out of Shane for most of the match. He hits the school-crushing finale on a chair, pins him, and before the count of three, Shane gets a foot on the rope. Well, it's no DQ... So rope breaks don't exist. And when, when Miz had Shane in a submission hold earlier, it was even said, like, Shane grabbed the ropes and the ref's like, can't help you, bro. No rope breaks. Now, this is where I'm a little bit fuzzy on this because if it's a pinfall, it's not like you're DQ'd if you don't disengage the pin if you're the guy making the pin attempt. So a rope break in a pinfall submission, to me is different than a rope break in a submission sense. But even the announcers jumped all over the official like, "Whoa, whoa, whoa, that should not have been a that shouldn't have been a break of the count. That should be a match." And you know, they just kept going with it. So Shane's sweating buckets and buckets and buckets and buckets of sweat. Gross. They actually kind of found a way to play that into the story at the end. Uh Miz despite throwing Shane back from the top of the cage into the ring, just kind of flipping him over the edge, not the high superplex thing like he would try later. Uh, that didn't put Shane away either. Then he tries for the superplex back into the cage, but Shane, with his immaculate sweat, slips out of the Miz's grip and falls to the outside, winning the match once again, despite again getting the ever-loving piss beaten out of him. One star, 
I guess they're continuing the storyline. I what momentum is there? I thought the blow off was gonna be in the Super Showdown or whatever, the next Saudi Arabia pay per view. I was like, okay, it's stupid, but whatever. We're gonna get we're gonna get the blow off there where the tiebreaker will be decided. Nope, Shane's up 2-0. Can we move on? I hope so. One star. Next, we got another complete waste of space. Roman Reigns versus Elias. No, I am not moving in chronological order. I'm trying to build towards the better matches at this point. Although I tried to lead off with a fairly strong one as well. This is not a match. This is not a match. Roman walking to the ring before his music even hits. Elias lays him out with a guitar shot in the back. Comes out. Uses an electric guitar. Finally gets to play a song for once. Even had a couple decent lyrics in there. Okay, cool. Takes his long, slow, victorious walk out. Uh, heading back to the back locker room, and then right as he gets to the stage, and it's just stupid because here comes Roman with the Superman punch, hits him so hard, Elias literally rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls and rolls until he hits the apron. He's basically back in the ring. Roman throws him in the ring, bell rings, spear, one, two, three, seven seconds. Zero stars. Zero stars. This feud is nothing. It is so stupid. There's no build. Elias, the, the anointed greatest draft pick in SmackDown history, or acquisition, excuse me, in SmackDown history. No, it's Roman Reigns. We know, as far as they're concerned, it's Roman Reigns. But Jesus, man, let the guy have a real match. And I, here's the thing that gets under my skin, too. They talk about how, oh, well, at WrestleMania, you know, they're still talking about, like, is, you know, we think Roman Reigns might finally be back to 100%. That he might finally be ready. WrestleMania was eight weeks ago. So anytime you're talking like you think he might be there, by the way, they're still not testing him to show that he really is. But anytime you talk about that, all you're doing is further undercutting Drew McIntyre for losing at WrestleMania. I know it was a feel-good story for Roman to come back and win at WrestleMania, but good lord. When you're implying, oh, when he came back, he was maybe 70% Roman Reigns. Well, 70% Roman Reigns clearly was still enough to put away Drew McIntyre with one spear at WrestleMania in a lackluster match. Good for you. Way to, way to make McIntyre, Vince's other former chosen one, look good. Jesus, this match sucked. Uh, I don't have any problem with Roman, for the record. I don't have a problem with Roman, but I'm not going to say that this was a good match because... Man, oh man, this was not a good match. Moving on. Raw Women's Championship match. Becky, two belts. Her first of two title defenses on this night. Now is where I am going to lose my shit. Because while I don't have a problem with the ultimate outcome, I have a problem with everything that led to it. So let me dive in here. Lacey Evans is a phenomenal prospect for Raw. Great Great to keep her and Becky engaged in a program even moving forward. I support that wholeheartedly. Becky versus Charlotte is a stupid played out feud. It shouldn't have even continued to the extent that it has. And I, and I want it to go away. It's stupid go away. But it won't. Like Becky said in her promo, uh, Charlotte is the web that management won't let her, her being Becky, untangle herself from. They just keep them paired together because they always want charlotte there and there's truth to that they refuse to put charlotte anywhere but the title picture and i get it charlotte is phenomenal she's okay on the mic she's phenomenal in the ring pound for pound probably the best performer they've got that's no shade at becky that's no shade at bailey or sasha or you know whoever she's great ronda rousey is very good in the ring too although she still needs to work on not hurting people she still has a tendency to do that the wwe tries to gloss over a little bit but i digress so this match physical match they actually let lacey evans get a lot of offense in that was a little bit not a surprise because i knew they wanted her to look strong even in defeat as i batter stuff around here i knew they wanted her to look strong even in defeat i knew she was going to lose but I was curious of how they were going to go about it because obviously that says a lot about their booking going forward. So, one weird moment in the match to me, Lacey Evans, the lady of the WWE, by the way, she's built like a freaking house, like a muscle. Like she's, she's basically a carbon copy of uh, Charlotte, but with more muscle. And that 
<laughs> that's like the two Spider-Man meme, the meme of two Spider-Men pointing at each other like, you, you. But, uh, sh- so Lacey Evans takes this cloth, this uh, handkerchief out from her pants. She dabs her face, which it was in, it was in your crotch, presumably. So why are you like, <laughs> And then she wipes her armpit. This is the greatest self own I've ever seen. She then wipes her armpit and then proceeds. So wipes her armpit and then proceeds to dab her mouth again. You're what are you doing? You're down here scrubbing your crotch. You're touching your face. You're scrubbing your own pit. And then you're touching your mouth again. And then uh, and after that, she grabs Becky. She tries to cram it in Becky's mouth. Gets a little bit of it in Becky's mouth. Becky then hulks up because she's pissed off at this disrespect. She goes off. And the, the match is, is, is a little screwy. There's a moment late in the match. That's another ref botch as far as this. I think the execution was there. But I, I don't know if the ref just botched not getting into position for the count or what. And this was again picked up on the broadcast team. There's a moment late in the match where Lacey Evans... Strikes the back of Becky's knee, kind of like a dirty hit when Becky's back is turned. Uh, chop block, essentially. And the impression is like, okay, uh, so that's going to be the storyline lead into her match with Charlotte. That's going to then be like, oh, Charlotte's going to go after the knee now. Why Lacey Evans felt the need to go after the knee when her move isn't that? I don't know. But whatever. So that's what they're setting up for, it looks like. And that is not what they're setting up for. Because then you get a pinfall submission. Lacey Evans rolls up Becky Lynch. And it looks like a three, it easily a three count. Maybe a four count. I don't know if a five count maybe. But the referee's kind of like, he like runs to the other side. And then before the referee, right as the referee's starting to get down into position, Becky reverses out of it. Maybe Becky was slow on the call. Maybe Becky wasn't even supposed to be down for like a second, but kind of like forgot herself for a moment. I don't know what happened here. Becky kicks her legs, rolls over straight into the disarmor. And before Becky even cranks back on the submission, you already have Lacey Evans awkwardly like, eh, 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 like tapping out. And it's like, usually when people are tapping out in a submission, they're showing like desperation or like pain something like that they don't like awkwardly like robotically tap out you know there's urgency to it there was nothing here and this was just a weird finish to the match becky retains uh uh, two and a half star match i mean it was an okay match it was serviceable i think for lacey evans first women's championship match i thought it was serviceable and you know she showed herself to be a credible threat to becky Becky just gets over, you know, excluding the ref botch. Becky just gets over with the Wiley veteran move. Cool. As Becky is heading to the back, Charlotte Flair's music hits. And Charlotte's like, "Uh uh-uh, we're going in this match right now. Right now. Here we go. And at at first I was thinking like, all right, because I always try and think of this in a real world application here. What are they telling us? You know what I mean? Like, If this was real life, what would the explanation be here? Is it that this match was always scheduled to be back-to-back for Becky to go back-to-back two matches in a row, and therefore she should have just she should have known the schedule, or is it that she was like, oh yeah, you're right, I forgot. Damn, now I got to do this again. No, no, no. The announcers tell us, oh no, Becky didn't have to do this. Becky was goaded into doing this by Charlotte for being, you know, her being smug. Are you fucking kidding me? That's the explanation you're going to give me. You're going to tell me that not every single match is meticulously planned. At the very least, not talking time frame. Because obviously if this was a shoot thing, if this was real, you don't have that knowledge. But you, at the very least, you know the order of the card. You're telling me that Charlotte, the challenger of all people, is allowed to make that power play to make that happen? Come on, son. Come on. Whatever. All right, so we got another Becky Lynch Charlotte Flair match now, back to back. Becky came out early on, you know, playing with some extra desperation. Uh, misses a splash. Charlotte takes over, and then Becky's just on the defense for most of this match. You get a spot late in the match where Charlotte tries to hit the natural selection on the ring apron. Becky hangs onto the rope. Charlotte crashes hard to the mat, falls outside. Becky's telling the ref, "Go, go, count, count, count her out." 
Becky, meanwhile, drapes back and rests on the rope, you know, facing the stage and everything. Well, not facing the stage. Her body on the side of the rope's facing the stage. She's looking at where Charlotte is. Referee gets somewhere around like a six or seven count. And then, oh, look, here comes Lacey Evans again. And she hits her with the woman's right, uh, which is her devastating move of doom. Uh, Charlotte swoops in, and she charges Becky. I don't know if she was going for a spear or what. Becky gets another, Becky gets a quick sudden roll up, and we have another ref botch on a pinfall. It looks like a three count. I, I don't know if this was intended to be a two count, and they just slightly fucked it up in terms of the timing, but you get the crowd, one, two, three, and then like the crowd called three. The ref's hand looked like it hit for three, and then they just go, I mean, no. What? Becky gets up. Charlotte hits her with the big boot. One, two, three. Becky, two belts is no more. The SmackDown Women's Championship goes to Charlotte Flair. Oh, my God. Okay. Here's the thing, right? I said I was going to get back to Mandy Rose and Asuka from WrestleMania. Here it is. This is so fucking stupid. Like, this is pathetically, inexcusably stupid booking you know what this tells me this tells me that the only reason mandy rose and oscar lost their women's championship match at wrestlemania and got relegated to the women's battle royal was because of time it was a seven and a half hour fucking pay-per-view and they still cut the women's smackdown championship match in favor of of nothing they wanted further justification i guess to say here's why we're gonna make now becky ronda and charlotte the main event Ooh, further justification because the raw women's championship isn't enough to have to the equation having the three people indisputably at the top of the card the top of the division top of the industry for women's wrestling no 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 it's not good enough on its own, we need to now take the belt off Asuka, put it on Charlotte to give her record-tying number eight reign, tied with Trish Stratus, by the way, and then shove it into a winner-take-all match at WrestleMania. Because now we need further justification. We need an extra visual where Becky's not just holding one belt, she's holding two. Okay, whatever. Fine. Fine. I can forgive that if you do something with it. Now, I'm not saying go back to the days, the old days where you booked storylines a year or 18 months even in advance. I'm not. I'm really not. Because I understand in today's age, that just is completely impractical. The fact that they even pulled off the CM Punk 434-day title reign is incredible when you think about it. But I digress. They, they have pushed the hell out of the Becky Two Belts moniker ever since WrestleMania. They say, hey, for the first time ever, you're going to have the women's champion pulling double duty at a pay-per-view. She's going to defend the Raw Women's Championship and the SmackDown Women's Championships. She's taking on the hottest prospect in WWE right now for the division, the women's division and Lacey Evans. And the face of the division the past, what, four, five years? Something to that effect for Charlotte? I think 2013, 14, I want to say, is when they moved her up onto the main roster. Regardless... It's fine. I knew that they couldn't keep this going for like a year. But if you want to make this, if you're going to push merchandise and branding about Becky two belts, you keep the two belts on her at least for a minute, at least for a cup of coffee. This is the first time she did this defense. And I get it. You're risking, you're risking injury to her and you're risking burnout for her. I get it. But at the same time, what is the point of having the first ever undisputed women's champion in the in the history of WWE if you're going to do fuck all with it? Now, Chris Jericho's undisputed championship range was a bit of a farce by the end when they made it all about Triple H and Stephanie instead. But at the very least, he was treated as a big deal for the first stretch of it. I would have done three pay-per-views with Becky pulling double duty. 
I would have then, and if you don't want to do double duty, make one of those pay-per-views a triple threat, another winner-take-all match. That's all you got to do. You insist on having Charlotte in the picture? Fine. Do that. Have Lacey Evans in the picture as well. Have it be something where Becky wins both these matches and now the next pay-per-view, it's the same three of them, but now it's a triple threat winner-take-all match and now suddenly the alliance between Charlotte and Lacey Evans breaks down because they're fighting over who actually gets the pin and the title. That is storytelling. That's how you still build on something. WWE likes to book the baby faces to overcome everything. They don't do that here. Becky loses her, f I, I believe it's her first defense of the SmackDown Women's Championship. Certainly first pay-per-view defense since WrestleMania. She drops it and she drops it to Charlotte Flair. So Charlotte gets now the record-breaking ninth reign. Jesus Christ. Fine. Oh, what? Charlotte's reign's over? Okay. That was worth breaking the record for. They can't even do that right. So then you get this development after the match where Lacey Evans and Charlotte... Becky goes right after Lacey Evans because Becky just got screwed of the title. And now because Becky is still the Raw Women's Champion and not SmackDown, she's no longer pulling double duty. She's going to be on Raw and her program with Lacey is going to continue. Fine. Great. Fresh. Good. Heat to it. I like it. Charlotte comes out and keeps beating up Becky. Why? You're done. You get your title. You're done. Walk away. No, no. She hates her so much she doesn't even want her to have the Raw Women's Championship. So she wants to beat her down and make it where Lacey will get her in the next match. Okay. Whatever. If that's what you insist on. By the way, for this next match, I don't have the graphics, so I'm just going to explain it. So it's a 201 beatdown, just like the last Raw beforehand. Oh, here's the thing, too. Your promotional material for this pay-per-view was literally Becky sitting on a throne with both. You ran a fucking special, a behind-the-scenes look at the rise of the man, the woman behind the man, and her triumph of winning the two championships, making history. You announced it that night as a WWE Network special and took the belt off her. What fucking sense does that make? I'll get into that in a moment. So you get this two-on-one beatdown ensuing. Bailey runs out, makes the save. Becky does nothing in the fray. Charlotte goes for a spear on Becky, hits the corner, the turnbuckle, knocks herself out. Bailey debates her about five minutes, cashing in her new briefcase, and then decides, you know what? All right, I'm going to do it. Drag Charlotte to the middle of the ring, pin one, two, three. Are you fucking kidding me? Seriously, that's the best you can do. That is the best you can do. By the way, hey, shout out to Bailey. She is now essentially the first ever women's Grand Slam winner in WWE history. She was the NXT Women's Champion. She was the Raw Women's Champion, the SmackDown Women's Champion, and the Women's Tag Team Champion on Raw. No one else can say that. Hey, cool history for Bailey. She deserves it. Kudos to her. To me, the message that they're trying to send with this is a message to Sasha Banks. They still want to work it out with Sasha Banks and bring her back. We know that her and Bayley uh, were having issues after WrestleMania when they found out they were, in fact, going to be dropping the belts so quickly after winning them, even though they had been promised a long title reign. Uh, Sh Sasha flips shit. Bayley apparently, I guess backstage stuff says that uh, Sasha's kind of a bad influence on Bayley, so Bayley threw a fit with her. But as soon as Charlotte, or not Charlotte, as soon as Sasha has been gone. She's been gone since Mania, even canceled public uh, interviews and stuff uh, related to the company since then. Bailey, in less than six weeks, now won the Money in the Bank contract and the SmackDown Women's Championship. So whether they're trying to signal to Sasha, like, look, look, no, I know you're frustrated because you feel like you're not being used properly, but look, look, we're listening. Whether it's that or it's like, okay, fuck you too. She stuck around, so she gets rewarded. And you're going to have to eat that and know that you walked out. And because she had the guts to stay, she gets the reward and not you. I don't know what their message is trying to be in this case. I assume they want to keep her because with AEW being like it is, they're desperate not to lose talent to them. And they would love to have Sasha Banks in AEW. So, oh my God. Uh, Becky versus Charlotte. Two stars. Star and a half. I don't know. A, not a great match. The storytelling was there, but then the fucking ending and another goddamn ref botch. Really? Uh, so short-sighted. Again, the f the conclusion is fine. 
having Bailey be the champion is fine. It honestly is. If you they they would be afraid of turning Bailey heel in this process, which I don't even think you can do. But if you had had Becky beat Charlotte, and then while you know the beatdown starts between Lacey Evans and Charlotte on Becky, Bailey comes out, and while Becky is taunting after they run off the heels behind her back, Bailey quietly hands the briefcase to the referee. They, they ring the bell. And then right as Becky turns around, Bailey to belly, pin her one, two, three. Have it be where, like, suddenly she is baffled. Like, Becky is baffled. She's just like, there's no way. I pulled double duty. I just went through the two of the, like, it's, it's fine. CM Punk was able to cash in in underhanded ways. I know he did it on a heel. But cash in with an underhanded way and stay a face. Imagine how that would do it. Like, if you take Bailey's character and you add just a little splash of gray area to her, I think she's way more compelling and interesting. And they're finally stop. They finally stop pushing her as just the like, oh, she's just too innocent. She just doesn't want to hurt anybody. They finally stop pushing that, so that's good. But that would have been better, and you still would have gotten the same result. So that's me saying, even if you're gonna give up on Becky two belts, at least don't do Charlotte as a fucking transition champion. Because now, to Charlotte's credit, you just wasted her record-breaking reign. It was two minutes long. It was probably a little longer than that, but it pathetic. What's the point? Why? Why? There is none. It's short-sighted. It's stupid. It's like they knew where they wanted to go, but they were too fucking lazy to take the proper steps to get there, to tell compelling, logical storytelling to get there. So the Bailey versus Charlotte match, zero stars. Literally not a move. Bell rings, drags her in the middle of the ring, pin, one, two, three. No stars. I like the result. I like the result in terms of literally just Bailey is the, now the champion. But shit, this was a fucking waste. I, I mean that even for Charlotte's sake, this was a fucking waste. Who wants to have the record-breaking reign if it lasts not even long enough to enjoy a cup of coffee? I, pff, whatever. Uh, where's a match that'll make me happy now? All right, uh, let's go into the match of the night, in my opinion. Seth Rollins versus AJ Styles. Holy fuck was this a great match. This match lived up to the hype. This is one of those dream matches we wanted to see for years. Ever since AJ Styles came to the WWE, we wanted to see this match. And we fucking got it. This was fantastic. Fantastic match. I would argue it's a match of the year candidate. Now, I never doubted whether or not Seth Rollins would walk away with the championship. I, actually, let me let me replace that. There was a moment late in the match I did go, whoa, whoa, what? Oh, okay, okay. So there was a moment where I literally did second guess it. But for the most part, I knew going into the match, it's Rollins' first Universal Championship defense at a pay-per-view. They're not going to take the belt off him. It is what it is. So let's just roll Let's just roll with it. Great match. These guys had phenomenal chemistry. These are probably two of the five best performers in the world today. And it showed, man. They fucking gelled great. I can't stand, like, Rollins versus Lesnar. More on that later. I can't stand matches like that. They're fucking spot fest, and they're just like 100 miles an hour for four minutes, and then I'm supposed to act like it was a good match. This was a 20-plus minute match. Hard-fought, physical, told a story, was emotionally draining, and yet you never saw the crowd let down or turn on it because it was quality this match this was a great match one of the best styles clash reversals i've ever seen rollins goes for the stomp and like as his momentum is carrying him aj literally has him loaded up in like the blink of an eye in a styles clash and you're just like oh and that was the moment where for a second i thought he might get him uh in typical typical wwe circumstances however what you're gonna get out of this is the babyface, especially the babyface champion, he's magically capable of kicking out of the other guy's finisher. And the other guy, the challenger, whether he's babyface or heel, is typically not as capable as kicking out. The Styles Clash rarely puts anybody away uh, in WWE, unfortunately. They typically make AJ's finisher the phenomenal forearm. But, you know, or the calf crusher if he gets a submission. But, you know, it was great. Uh, fantastic back and forth action. I'm not going to draw too much on this match. 
I can just say I highly recommend checking this match out. I'm giving it four and a half stars. Uh, what would make it a five star match for me? It's a good question. Um, I hesitate to call it a five star match. And I don't feel like it ran too long. I don't feel like it outstayed its welcome. I guess maybe if AJ had had, if he had taken a curb stop once earlier in the match and managed to kick out like Rollins kicked out of his Styles Clash and escaped his calf crusher, then it would have felt a little more even if like two curb stomps or maybe, maybe even tell a story like something no one ever does. If they hit the finisher, it's always implied like, oh, he got all that. No, have it be like the curb stomp where he kind of got AJ, but his foot kind of slipped away. And so AJ hit the mat, but it wasn't with the full force he could normally deliver. And so that one doesn't put him away. But when he gets it later on, he really gets it. And that's what ends the match. So there you go. Four-star match. Fantastic. I highly recommend going on to WWE Network and uh, checking this match out. This is, to me, the best match, obviously, of early 2019. Uh, let me see here. I'm going to jump now into, I got two matches left. I'll be quick. Kofi Kingston versus Kevin Owens. Uh, this was refreshing because Kevin Owens came back as a badass. I got tired of the dad humor shtick they were doing with his return uh, when he came back from, I think, five months off with double knee surgery. Kevin Owens, he is a conniving, vicious, brutal, very athletically gifted, especially for a big man. Big man. <laughs> And the worst thing they were doing before he left with his injury is they were just treating him as a fucking joke, feeding him to Braun Strowman left and right. It was ridiculous. Kevin Owens, there's no reason he shouldn't be at least hovering around the championship picture. Uh, the whole Big O where he was the honorary third member of the New Day and he was kind of doing Big E shtick while Big E's out with, uh, I think, meniscus surgery or something. I, I didn't go for that very much but seeing him turn on Kofi and return to those ways that was great his in-ring psychology his trash talk all of that is mwah, spot on as always uh in this match Kofi tells Xavier Woods I don't want you out there I want to do this on my own I want to prove myself on my own and Kofi man he brought out another fantastic match Kofi Kingston he's continues his magical run not just because of the obvious result but because his quality in the ring has really gone to another level and it kind of does make you wonder if he didn't get buried years ago by Randy Orton in one of his freaking bipolar meltdowns, uh, how Kofi's career would have shaken out differently compared to what it is now. And that's not to say it's been a bad career. It obviously hasn't been, but would he have had more major championship runs, uh, you know, another WWE championship or a world heavyweight championship or universal champion, you know, whatever. So yeah, this was a fantastic match. There was a weird moment late, uh, you know, there, there was good drama in one moment where Kofi hits the trouble in paradise, but Kevin Owens falls out of the ring, and Kofi has the like, ah, oh, no, no. That's always great drama when they milk it because it's like he's so desperate and he's so exhausted, and then it's just like, oh, no, I can't get the pinfall now. Oh, no. There's a weird mat uh, moment later on where I guess Kevin Owens is like, I'm not getting kicked in the head by these shoes again. And so he just takes off Kofi's kicks, which just look like freaking sneakers. And he just chucks him into the crowd. And you're like, okay. But then Kevin Owens goes, it's over. He climbs the freaking top turnbuckle. He tries to send on Kofi gets the knees up. Kevin Owens stands up. Takes trouble in paradise from a barefoot Kofi Kingston with his pink fluffy socks. Kofi Kingston pins him for the win. Like, okay. It's a good match, but what the hell was the point of the shoes? They didn't even work. <laughs> even if you were like, uh, he can't stand up very easily in the ring in just his socks. Okay, he did. Well, he can't kick me hard enough to knock me out with his... Uh, okay, he did. So, uh, it's okay. I mean, it's, it's a good match. I thought this was a quality match. I'd say uh, three, three and a half stars. Yeah, three and a half stars. Let's say that. I thought this was a good match. Uh, I, I honestly was coming in thinking I would not have been shocked if they had taken the belt off Kofi here because... It's kind of like Kofi's getting this great little tour run for himself right now as far as um, kind of like a Lifetime Achievement Award at WrestleMania. Here's your WrestleMania moment. You get to have this one of the best WrestleMania moments in history, and we're going to let you run with this for a month or so. I don't expect it to be a long title reign even now, but he is at least making it hard for them to take the belt off him with how he's performing. So kudos to Kofi Kingston. This was a another solid match. I think Kevin Owens was great in this match as well. Uh, I want to see more from both of these guys moving forward, whether their feud continues or whether they go a different direction. 
Uh, I'm excited to see what they're going to do on SmackDown in the world title picture. Sorry, WWE Championship picture. Now on to the car crash to end all car crashes. The men's Money in the Bank ladder match. Holy shit. So, Sami Zayn is pictured in this. Sami Zayn is not in it. A background storyline going on throughout the course of the night is Sami Zayn is afraid Braun Strowman, because of what they did on Raw the previous week, uh, is going to basically make sure he can't compete. And so he's trying to talk to Triple H. He's like, no, no, no. You, you gotta do something. You can't let him take away this opportunity from me. I won that match fair and square. Uh, whatever. Triple H says, don't worry about it. Braun is banned from the building. Well, then, a few minutes later, we see Braun Strowman storming through the back. Triple H finds him and is basically like, no, no, man. You, you just gotta go. You gotta get out of here. You gotta get out of here. Braun Strowman leaves. Then we come back later on in the show, and suddenly Sami Zayn is strung upside down, unconscious in the back, and tr they're doing, like, the whole, like, someone else came running to Triple H and told him, and they're all running, the camera crew's chasing, and you don't really get a good look at anything, but Sami Zayn's laid out and strung up by his feet. And the implication was... Uh, Braun Strowman, by the way, says like he didn't do it. The implication at the time was that Braun did it. And I thought this would be a great moment for Bray Wyatt to make his debut. Uh, and that would be really interesting to have Bray Wyatt debut with such a huge moment where he comes out even late in the match uh, in his new gimmick and get immediately thrust into a title picture now. Bray doesn't need the, the title, but it would be an interesting way to like full force behind it push it. And to, to Sammy's credit, uh, he was my dark horse to win the match. Uh, that was before I realized they weren't even going to let him in the match. I thought his new gimmick was getting over great. And I was kind of disappointed with, uh, with the result. I wanted to see Sami Zayn in this match because he's fantastic in these matches. So the match itself, spot fest galore. I loved the blend of talent in this match. Shout out to Baron Corbin. I can't stand Baron Corbin. I thought he had a lot of great moments in this match, and they didn't feel forced great moments like uh, the choke slam of, I think it was Ali through the announce table. Whew, primo stuff. Uh, that was one of the best looking choke slams I've seen in some time. Uh, he catches, I think it's Ricochet diving over the top in a deep six on the outside. Ooh, so nice. Uh, Drew McIntyre, I always want to say Galloway. Uh, McIntyre had several great moments as well, several great power moments. Andrade and Ali hit a freaking ridiculous ass Spanish fly off the ladder into the ring. That was insane. Randy Orton picked and chose his spots. Kept doing the backdrop on the announce table thing that he did all the time. It's almost become cliche for him. In fact, he does it one, two, three times in a row to different guys in this match, literally on the same table. And the guys are just stacking up as they roll off the other side of it. It's kind of comical. Um, oh, God. Finn Balor. Good God. You guys know he's your Intercontinental Champion, right? You know that you've got a lot invested in him, all things considered. Because holy crap, you guys made it your mission to murder Finn Balor's spine in this match. Of all the bumps in Money in the Bank, Finn Balor might have taken the most and the worst. Like the stiffest. Not just Andrade's... Uh, what was it I'm looking for? Sunset Flip power bomb off the top of the ladder onto another ladder stacked on the rope. That was insane. Finn Balor, first of all, Andrade hits it first. So with between the, so let me try and illustrate this for you. Between the ladder pushing down with Andrade hitting it with his ass first before Balor does, the ladder, you know, the thought is that as Balor is hitting it, he's hitting it with the ladder moving with him because of the ropes, and then it's just going to catapult him up. So it's not going to be that devastating. That was the theory. But because Andrade hits it first, the ladder already goes down. Then, by the time Balor hits, the ladder is coming back. So it just smashes his spine, and then it still has enough force that it still catapults him five feet in the air, and he lands again on it. And it was just like, oh, God. He got slammed on the edge, like the ladder propped up, you know, on its side. He got slammed on the edge of that. I mean, just good God the things they were doing to Finn Balor's spine. Uh, Ricochet takes a terrible slam too through the ladder when it's propped on the announce table in the ring apron and it's the crunch fold in half kind of thing. Ricochet took a wicked uh, hit as well. This match was insanity. Uh, I thought, I didn't think Corbin was going to win again for a second time. 
I thought it was going to be Ali because we know that Kofi Kingston was able to basically steal away, not because of anything he did, but because Randy Orton, of all people, go figure with the symmetry there, because Randy Orton injured Ali before his program with Daniel Bryan, uh, Kofi got bolted in, then Kofi captured the hearts and everything of the WWE Universe, and because of that, now Kofi's on this run, and Ali's just kind of like, shit, it wasn't even my fault that I lost it. So they have a moment late there when Ali's at the top, and you're like, oh, wow, okay, so Ali's getting the makeup call right now. Okay, well, that's... Then they hit Brock Lesnar's music, and I was like, oh, my God, this is who took out Sami Zayn. They're going to say that there's a man down, and there has to be another contender, I guess, even though that's not really a thing. Brock Lesnar comes out, shoves a ladder over outside the ring, nearly murders three cameramen in the process, <laughs> uh, whacks them with this ladder, just total monster disregard. And no, that's not booked. That's just him being a fucking reckless asshole. Uh, Brock comes out, pushes the ladder over with Ali Ali. It looks like he takes a little bit of an awkward hit. He was supposed to drape across the top rope like you see all the time. But he hits like his mouth because when you see him on the outside, he's got blood all coming out of his mouth. Not like gushing, but it, it seems like he cut his lip or something somehow on the, the rope. And, uh... Brock sets up the ladder, and as Brock starts climbing the ladder, two things become apparent. One, holy shit, yes, Brock Lesnar is about to win this championship, literally doing nothing. Two, Brock Lesnar has never climbed a ladder in his life, because he's like all shitty and grin, like, <laughs> he gets halfway up that ladder, and there's a little shimmy to it, and you just see him go like, oh. <laughs> Suddenly, he's much, much quieter and like, less arrogant as he's climbing the ladder he gets it he you know he, he gets the uh the briefcase down wins the match and then just kind of gently okay now i'm supposed to like cross over and sit on top of it like it was just that part was a little funny to me just because of how awkward and uncomfortable you could tell he was up there hey no disrespect i wouldn't i would be fucking shitting my pants up there because it's a 20 foot ladder you get up there in the middle of the ring and you're just like oh my god i <laughs> just Oh my god, so Brock Lesnar, your Money in the Bank champion, here's the problems with this. One, I'm fucking sick of Brock Lesnar. I am. But he did announce he's officially retired from MNA. Doesn't mean he's going to be around or working a heavier schedule now. He's spoiled, he gets a shit ton of money. Paul Heyman got like $150,000 just for being at ringside. He didn't talk, he didn't do anything. I didn't even hear a, oh my god, like that you'll hear from Heyman sometimes on the outside. I didn't hear shit, but Heyman got a, a cool payday out of that, I heard. So, imagine what they gave Brock. Uh, last minute decision. Apparently, this was made in the middle of the afternoon by Vince. Go fucking figure. Uh, so, Brock's going to stay in the title picture, but here's the problems with that. One, it means we're going to have another fucking Rollins versus Lesnar match. Two, it means Lesnar's probably going to get the belt back real quick. Because, what's the fucking point? The Money in the Bank winner there's a reason the reason they started having guys cash in the same show was because they had multiple matches each brand has its own match so you always keep one to keep that trump card if you will and they're gonna run with it for most of the year typically that's the process brock's not gonna do that shit and even if he was gonna do that shit half the excitement of money in the bank is when are they going to cash in? When are they going to cash in? When are they going to cash in? Oh, the champion's down. The champion's wounded. Is he going to cash in? Huh? 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 No. No, he's not. Okay, maybe next. You know what I mean? Like, that's the process. That's how it works. Brock Lesnar has like four dates a year that he works. He never shows up on Raw unless it's to promote one of the big four pay-per-views right fucking before the pay-per-view. He barely shows up to the pay-per-views in general, again, unless it's a major pay-per-view or it's Saudi Arabia who's just money whipping the shit out of him in the process to get him there. It's worthless. N another, Le Re Le another Lesnar reign is disastrous and fucking meandering as shit the last four years we've had anyway. But now you're not even going to give us the real threat of a money in the bank cash in. F by the way, same problem, I guess, if Lesnar was your champion already and someone else won the briefcase, when are they going to get to cash in? He's never fucking there. So it's just so stupid. This is so stupid of a decision. Guys, that would have made all the sense in the world. Drew McIntyre would have made all the sense in the world. Vince's former chosen one has been booked strong 
for the most part, but they won't give him that push even into a main event program. He deserves it. He's there. He is absolutely worthy of it. Randy Orton, I don't I don't want Randy Orton in the picture again, but who knows? They'll probably give him one more run before he's done, just like they gave Cena one more run at some point. Uh, so those would have both been more acceptable than Lesnar. I mean, literally, anyone here would have been more acceptable, but let me just run through the basics of who I thought was most deserving. McIntyre, I wouldn't have put it on Balor because the Intercontinental Champion and having the Money in the Briefcase, Money in the Bank Briefcase, would have felt a little much, but as much as they've invested in him, uh, you know, whatever. I, I would have been okay with it, I guess. It would have been weird seeing it at some point the demon with the briefcase, but it is what it is. Uh, Sami Zayn, again, was my dark horse. I wanted him. Mufasa, I can't just say Mustafa Ali anymore. I said Mufasa first, Lion King. Uh, Ali would have made all the sense in the world because, again, as I said earlier, kind of a, a belated makeup call for him missing out on his WrestleMania moment. Whatever. Here's your main event program. You're not going to win, but fitting that Kofi would then have to defend against the guy he benefited from his injury. I worded that a little awkwardly, but uh, Kofi benefited from the Ali injury. It'd be a fitting program to now see them go at it. Uh, I don't know how their styles would clash. I would assume it'd be almost like a borderline 205 Live main event, which would be interesting, but whatever. Uh, Ricochet. Ricochet, man. I want to see more out of Ricochet. I think there's a lot of potential with him. They gave him some cool spots in the match, but I was a little surprised I didn't get the best moment of the night from him. It seemed like it seemed like Andrade and all these other guys were making the big moments happen around him. Andrade would have been another solid uh, guy. I know Andrade's on, I believe, Raw now, but I would have... No, Andrade did come back to SmackDown, didn't he? Because he's with Charlotte Flair. Yeah, so there you go. Andrade. And then have Andrade versus Kofi. That would have been fantastic. Uh, any of those guys. The only guys I wouldn't have put my money on would have probably been Randy Orton and uh, Baron Corbin, I guess. So, And Lesnar. But, you know, basically across the board, that's, that's just how this thing shook up. Uh, again, these aren't all the card results, but they're the ones that kind of matter more. I felt like this was a clusterfuck of a pay-per-view. The problems I felt like it, and I'm going to be real quick with this as I wrap this up. The referee booking angle that kept rearing its head, fucking awful, because it does two things, both of which disastrously. It tells you either, one, it's trying to be 50-50 booking to the absolute extreme, where it's like, oh, even if the babyface loses or even if the heel loses, they got screwed over, so you really can't be upset. No, because now they look they both look worse for wear because of that. Becky getting the benefit of a screwy thing in the first match doesn't look better for getting the worse of it in the second match. It just looks like it evens out. So she doesn't get the benefit now from the Charlotte thing in that. Charlotte doesn't look better because she got a false win. It it's just it's stupid. It's utterly stupid and it achieves nothing nothing and it'd be one thing if he did it once in one match but to do it in three or four matches and again i can understand the samoa joe one that one was a safety thing but jesus christ man it was just so bad and so stupid i might have made both points without actually listing what number two was it doesn't help either competitor all it does is undermine both competitors involved uh let me see here i had another notes i had hey i actually have done pretty good on this rant i haven't had to check my notes at all until this very moment so uh let me see here uh, the screwy finishes in general the incompetent officials yeah no i did list it basically in there uh screwy fish uh finishes don't help anyone i said that and the incompetent officials doesn't make sense either it's basically one and one a i guess but whatever it doesn't benefit anybody. All it does is further make a mockery of the thing. And to do it once, uh, okay, whatever. To do it twice is like, okay, dude, stop. To do it three times, dude, fucking stop. To do it four times, are you are you fucking kidding me? Stop. <laughs> like, this is ridiculous. So all in all, I give Money in the Bank 2019. I'm going to give it a C+. Plus. I'm going to give it a C plus. Oh, the grade for this match, I'm going to give it... I would have given it three and a half stars. You know what? No, I would have given it four stars. I'm going to give it three, though, because of the Brock Lesnar screw finish at the end. So stupid. Ruins a good match. Takes all the piss out of it. 
uh, crowd not booing because they're like, oh, no, I hate Lesnar. Boo! Boo! He took it from Ali! No, no one fucking cares about that. They're booing because they're fucking sick of it. No one wants a champion that's never there. No one wants a Money in the Bank winner that's never there. No one wants a guy who has been gone five minutes from a lengthy, boring-ass, wasted title reign. Oh, my God, man. I might have to do another video at some point ranting about recent Vince McMahon decisions because it's, it's atrocious what's happening right now. But that's going to do it for this. Thank you for tuning in. Uh... <laughs> I didn't even, I realize now I got so into this, I didn't even do a proper intro for the podcast, but uh, I've been DDP. This has been Feeling Dangerous. Stay tuned, more to come.